I always say this. What is CAN, AutoCAD? What is GIS? Well, it's something else. And then I say that Autodesk has this theory that CAD and GIS is the same thing. That we actually have the product that bridges those two. So when you're talking about AutoCAD, you typically are looking at engineering data. When you're talking about GIS, you're typically looking at map-related data. But as far as we are concerned, if you really go down to the technicality of the things, it's still geometry with attributes. And what we are doing with Map3D is we're providing a product which can actually do the same. It can be a GIS product if you're looking for GIS. It can also be a CAD product if you're looking for CAD. If you're trying to convert CAD data into GIS data, Map3D can do that. If you're looking at GIS data and, and you want to use engineering precision with that, Map3D can do that. So let me just quickly start with the new map, Map3D 2006. Okay, I'm just going to start with a simple ACAD or DWT because I will talk about the interface very quickly. This, what you see over here, is actually an AutoCAD. Now I'm sure most of you, at least some of the people who I've presented this to, the first impression that they get is it doesn't look like AutoCAD. And that is precisely the idea. Okay, we want to get away from this whole concept of CAD being a black background and you have your AutoCAD menus and focus on this product like a GIS product where you're talking to people who do data capture for GIS information, geographical information, geometry information which has attributes associated with it. So quickly just have a look at the menus on top there. It's not AutoCAD anymore. You see that. It doesn't have the whole AutoCAD kind of look with a map menu item like what you always have. It's an uh, interface that has been configured to enable a GIS professional to use AutoCAD in a GIS manner. So when you talk about files, importing, exporting files, and this has always been a strength of ours, the fact that you can import and export file, uh, the industry standard GIS data formats. So if I want to import, I can just go to import and vector files. Okay? If I want to export to a certain format, I would go to ex export, and I have AutoCAD export, vector files, image export, and MapCAD export. Okay, when it comes to uh, featured sources and so on, again, it's all on the file menu. Again, for some of you who may not be aware of this, I'm just going to quickly show you some of the fe some of the file formats we support. I'm going to read through them: ESRI coverage, E00 shape, GML, MapInfo MIF mid, MapInfo tab. I stopped there because MapInfo users, or at least some of you who have customers who are MapInfo users, you know that they do a lot of mapping work, like analysis and map production and so on. But where do they get the data from? Typically, they capture it on AutoCAD. So what are we giving them as a value add? We're saying that you can use the AutoCAD interface, but instead of having to go to DXF and then go into MapInfo, reload it in, and start doing your attribution, you have an option now of directly doing attribution as you digitize. And that's what Math3D can do for you. It saves you that effort of, of going into DXF and back and forth. So we are directly talking to MapInfo tab. If you want to do an edit okay, of a tab of a MapInfo file, you don't have to convert it back to DXF and bring it back to AutoCAD. You can directly open it in, uh, in tab, make the edit, save it back, and then you can go back into your MapInfo and use it. So the first takeaway. Map3D can be a complement to existing GIS solutions. Okay? So if you have existing accounts that are ESRI customers, MapInfo customers, and I'll even point this out, there's actually a MicroStation DGN. Map is the only product, Map and Civil 3D is the only product that we have from Autodesk that can read DGN. Right? AutoCAD cannot. So you have an option there as well. Okay? In both ways. Okay, let's just quickly look at the uh, other menu items. Edit, if you remember the whole thing about uh, if you want to make changes, if you want to edit your data, you go into the edit menu. I mean, this is more of a Microsoft edit menu kind of thing. View obviously has your viewing tools. Again, all AutoCAD functions, but just being uh, configured in a, in a manner to make it easier. If you are creating data, okay, you obviously go to the create menu. If you're modifying data, you go into the modify menu. Go to, if you want to analyze data, which is analysis related to topology and uh, stuff like network tracing and so on, you can go inside here. If you have requirements where you want to create DEMs or digital uh, elevation models, you want to create a surface and you want to create contours, those tools are also available here under the civil menu. menu. Okay? Uh, under setup, of course, this is where you define all the settings that are used in map. And finally, image, this is the raster design, all your imaging functions. 
and express tools, okay, digitization uh, productivity tools. Quickly looking at the menu again, you notice that the command line is gone? That's because we don't need the command line anymore. Again, what are we trying to do? We're trying to give this interface a look and feel of GIS. Simply because if you go into an ESR account or if you go into a MapInfo account and you show them this, they do not have to be worried that it's CAD. They can understand it as a GIS product and use it like they're used to it. The whole concept of having, and I'm going to talk about that in a sec right now, the concept of having a legend where you put in layers to display, you put styles to those layers, and you create your maps. Again, so you can do that straight away from Map Explorer. So we have a Map Explorer here. This is your project related data, display manager where you can do your stylization, and you have your map book which allows you to create maps. So okay, what, what I'm going to do now is I'm just very really quickly going to go and start with something called feature classification. Okay, now I'm going to give this as an example of, again of how you can make use of this new feature. Well, not really new, but definitely a very powerful feature in Map. Again, talk, to talk to these customers who understand the real world issues of their business, not necessarily the CAD issues and what is AutoCAD, what is MicroStation and all that sort of thing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open, let's say I'm going to, I'm going to talk to an electricity customer. Okay, so I just open this DWT file. And then what I go and do is I go and add a feature class definition. Okay, so I'm just going to go inside here. So since I'm working with electricity, I'll just load that in. And what you see sometimes is, what you see over here is in fact pretty amazing. Because as soon as I've done that, what I have ready is I have a tool that allows me to start capturing data. Not necessarily CAD data, not necessarily lines, arcs, point lines, but instead you're capturing cables, capacitors, duct bank, generators, ground point, junction site, <coughs> markers, stuff that utilities do all the time. So I'm just going to quickly go and do a little demo of that. So let's say if I were to just draw a cable, I just double click on that and I draw. As soon as I draw that, you see it automatically creates and defines a line type that the utility customer would understand for what they would require. Now again, if you're looking at it from a CAD perspective, what do we have to do for this? We have to go and create a polyline, convert the line style into the specific line style. But then again, if you're talking to someone who's in a GIS industry, all of this is overheads. They don't need to know this. All they look at is effectively the feature classification. So this is something, this is a very powerful tool that we can use in, in MAP. Again, quickly moving on because this is a bit of a crash course sort of a thing. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about our interface that we have with, with databases and enterprise GIS uh, backends. So in order to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with, a, with an empty uh, file where I already have some settings defined. Okay. So once I open this, you'll notice that it actually asked me to connect to a feature source definition. This is a, a bit of a login screen. The whole idea behind this is that map, again, becomes applied not just to file format data, but also to database formats. So for example, we support Oracle in this release. So I'm, this is what I'm using right now. Okay, I'm just going to connect in. And you're going to find that under my map explorer, we actually have connected to this particular feature source called Sheboygan, which is Oracle. But I'm also going to show you another thing. We also have a tool, now I'm just going to give you a little example here. Let's say you want to connect to an ArcGIS system. Now I click on Attach, we actually have a provider for ArcSD, which means your same map, the same map that I'm showing you right now, can also become a client to an ESRI system, which is running ArcSD in the backend. So what is the benefit here? The benefit here is that, again, Typically, in a workflow process, there's always some sort of digitization tool or data capture tool involved, and we make map like the universal data capture tool. Doesn't matter what backend you're using, even if you're using an ESRI backend, which is pretty complicated to set up on the backend side, if you want to do data capture, data updates, data modifications, in that native format, you can use a map client there. Okay, so I'm just gonna uh, go and do a couple of uh, little demos over here also to showcase the display manager capability. So you see over here we actually have two feature classes, lots and closed line parcels. So I'm going to go and do a query in my database. So in this case, if I just go into the display manager, effectively I'm just going to go and bring back some data from my data source. I have options as you can see of querying feature classes, layers, topology, raster, current drawing, attached drawings, feature sources which is your backend data, topology and so on. 
So in this case, I'm going to use feature, feature source. I'm going to go inside there. You see again over here, what we have is within the database, we have options, and maybe I'm getting a bit too technical here, but we have options of actually creating logical schemas as well. Which means that in the same uh, Oracle Spatial database, you can have a land-based schema, which has all the land information. You can have a utility schema, which has all the utility information. You can have uh, some sort of uh, tourist schema, I'm just using a random name here, for just bay points and markers, landmarks that you may want to have in terms of your map creation. Anyways, I'm going to do a query on this uh, parcels set. I'm going to go inside here, select that. I want to add a location filter here, so I'm just going to go and click on the location. Define that, just maybe just draw a little rectangle around here. Hit OK. So what it's actually doing right now is it's going into my database, doing a query on the Oracle Spatial Data, bringing the data in, and as soon as the data comes in, what it does, it directly takes me into the display manager as an element. Now again, think GIS, if you, especially if you, are, if you have used or if you have been to a GIS customer before. They do not have the concept of doing just data capture. They also have the concept of having organizing their information into layers or legend elements. So what I've done is I've done a query in my database. These are my parcels. I've created an item called parcels in my uh, in my map. So I'm just going to call parcels here. Then I want to add a style to it because it's not just enough seeing the data as raw data. I want to put some uh, stylization and add that effect to it. So I'm just going to go to click on add. Go add a thematic style here. In terms of a thematic style, I'm going to do one based on a range of numeric values. Uh, I'm going to get the value from my object data, or it could be my feature class data. So we're going to use some area information over here just to do a thematic based on area. What we're doing now is we're just reading the data from the database. Then we split them into groups. Hit OK. Now, because I have some option in terms of defining the styles, I'm just going to have a black uh, outline for my geometry and then I'm going, to go, I'm going to go and put a color fill. So I'm going to use a ramp over here. Some of this stuff is not new. It's been there for a while in map. But if you just look at the interface and again the workflow that you use in map, it is ent entirely GS. Whatever I've shown you right now, I've not done anything CAD. I've not used a single AutoCAD command per se. Although the commands are being used internally, I'm looking at this product, I'm using this product like I would use a map info, like I would use an ArcView or an Arc info. Okay, so now that we've done this uh, colorization, I could do additional things, like maybe I want to go and label some of these parcels as well. So in order to label them, of course, before that, because this is a polygon shape thing, I want to go and convert the thumbnail preview into a polygon. So we've done that. Then I'm going to go and do another query in my data source. So we're going to query the feature data source. This time I'm going to do it a bit smaller, a smaller region. Okay, the same, I'm going to apply another filter here. And we're just going to focus on little, this area over here. Having done that, what I want to do next is I want to add a, lab, uh, a text style to it because I want to label it. So I go into my style menu, go and add a text style. Okay, by default it just give, takes this uh, text label entity here. So I want to get this information from my uh, from my attributes. So I'm going to go into my attributes and let's just label the areas inside that. Okay. So I hit OK, yes. And if I zoom in, you see obviously this text is too small right now. But no worries, what we can go and do is we can just go and change the size of that text by just going into height and making that probably about one. Okay? So you see it's actually increasing size a bit, but again, one is too small still, so we're gonna go and make that maybe about five. Do you, do you see the size increasing of the text label? Now, if I want to, okay. If you actually, Edmund suggested I should zoom to a smaller area just to show you how the text behaves. But let's say if I move from five to seven, you'll see that the text becomes seven. Okay. If you go back to uh, five, okay, I'm springing it back to five. Now, having done all this, if I want to create a legend, I can go into my tools. Create legend and just drag that legend inside here. Again, I'm using AutoCAD. Okay, this is a CAD software. Stuff that you would never imagine doing in CAD. But a GIS professional does this all the time. And we can do this straight away. 
Yeah. Actually, now I've been talking GIS, GIS, GIS all the time, right? But you still will have customers who want to use the AutoCAD interface. Now you can imagine that if you go to an AutoCAD user who's been using Map with previous releases of Map and is very familiar with the AutoCAD menus, and although he appreciates the concept because they do it this way, they want to go back to the AutoCAD menu. Well, there's a nifty tool right now in um, in Map which is called Workspaces. So what I can do is I can go to my Workspaces, go and choose Map Classic, click on that, and it's like magic. Suddenly the whole thing becomes back to the old AutoCAD map kind of interface. There you go. <laughs> it's back to AutoCAD. If you're an AutoCAD user, if you're familiar with this, continue to use this. Okay, but if you are a GIS professional, this menu scares the hell out of you because there's absolutely nothing which is GIS over there. You know? But again, the concept still, the concept, coming back to the concept, it's a tool which can be both GIS and CAD. No other product in the industry can do this. And we actually, and, I'm, and, and don't just take my word for it, try and go and do demos with your customers. And you will see to yourself their reactions when they see stuff like this. Incidentally, if you are someone who doesn't need to use the civil tools, like you doesn't need to use surfaces, and you find that it's a bit of an extra functionality which is unnecessary, makes slows down the system because it has to load, we can go into Map 3D, in which case the civil menu will go away. So anyways, I'm going to go back to the Map 3D civil. And you'll find that I'm back to the original uh, setup, which is the GIS interface. Yeah? I'm going to close this. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some, another very cool feature. Now, in order to do that, I'm just going to go down to uh, a file that I've created beforehand because then I want to save some time here. So, I'm just going to open this. Okay, now in this case, what you're looking at is a properly created map. It's not just data, it's actually a map which has styles associated with it, with various layers associated with it. All these uh, stylization attributes are not just randomly selected, they're actually based on some preset criteria. So, so some of them, for example, the land information system, uh, the land information layer will consist of the land use type. Then we have some of the water water network data, which is obviously coming from a utility kind of definition. So you're just going to very quickly see what it looks like in a couple of seconds. But in this case, what it's doing is actually doing it at runtime. It's going into the database, bringing information in. I'm just going to do zoom window. Of course, you might notice that all our command lines actually now come in right next to the cursor. It's a new feature of AutoCAD 2006. And that's again a fact that whatever comes in 2006 AutoCAD automatically comes in map. And that's, I think, what uh, Edmund was adhering to as well earlier when he said that in terms of series, we don't have that disadvantage. I call it a disadvantage because the moment you see new AutoCAD, new features, and big stars, and you know people jumping around, it's all there in Map as well. Okay, directly comes in. So I'm going to just zoom into here, zoom to a smaller area. Now tell me, anyone looking at a snapshot of this, a bitmap maybe of this, will never ever even for a second think that this is a CAD software. You can look at the color combination that you can do. Look at the way we can display our data. <clears throat> Again, something which is definitely very useful for uh, GIS professionals. But what is even more useful is this ability to go and take this data and publish them out for reuse, like something like a map book. Okay, uh, if you remember in 2005 AutoCAD, there was this new feature called Sheet Set, where you could actually have a multiple, like you take layouts, multiple layouts, and you can put them all together into one bundle, and you could publish that into a DWF file or you can do it to a plotter. Well, we have something very similar. We're actually uh, tagging on that, but we take it a step further. We're doing this for mapping. So what I'm going to go and do over here is I'm going to go and create a new map book. Okay? I actually wanted to go through the steps manually because I want to show you how easy it is. And it's a beautiful demo to do as well. I go into map book. Okay, then I'm going to use this map display. So in my case, I have three, three maps defined here. One is the electricity map, one is the waterline map. I'm going to use the waterline map. Uh, in terms of my sheet template, I've already created one from before, so I'm going to use that. In this case, it's called uh, mapbook.dwt, which is down here. Title block, I'm going to use, again, okay, all of this is inside the template already, so it's, it's really, I'm just selecting Factors here. I want to use a scale of about 10. 
in terms of my tiling, I want to select the area I want to tile, so I'm just going to tile this area here. Okay, then I'm just going to go and preview the tiles just to see whether the tiles look okay. So can you see those little small dotted lines? I don't know whether you can see it from behind. But this actually gives you a preview of the area we're tiling. Now in my opinion, these tiles are too small. You're not going to get much information. So I'm going to go and change that. So I'm just going to exit from here. And I'm going to go back into my settings and make my scale about 50. Okay, then let's go and preview that. Okay, 50 looks about okay because you can actually get some information inside here. So now that I'm done with that, I'm going to go into my naming scheme. Now typically if you've ever seen a map, map book or any sort of a map for tiling uh, sort of a program, usually you number your pages, right? And the numbering is usually defined by maybe A, B, C, 1, 2, 3. So A1 would be the first one, B1 would be the second one, C1 would be the third one. So that's one main, one naming convention. Another naming convention is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Third one that you have is, okay, other way around, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, like that. And the fourth one is that you may have your own custom uh, tile numbers. So maybe, for example, in Thailand, you may have tile numbers there. Right, so you can obviously use your database for that. Right? One way of visualizing this is your street directories. You go to your bookshop, you buy a street directory, this is somewhat like that. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and add a key view. And in my key view, I have options of taking data from, exter from an external file. But in my case, I'm just going to use buildings, add that in, and maybe I'm going to use parcels as well. So I have parcels there, I'm going to add that in. And in terms of my legend, I'm going to use the map display legend that map creates for you. Now that I've done all this, I'm just going to click on generate. Okay, it already exists, but never mind. I just hit okay. So what map is doing for you right now is it goes and creates those styles and creates a sheet set, as you can see. Okay? So now if I want to go to, let's say, A5, I can just zoom to tile, and I love this, the way it zooms in. I want to zoom to tile B5, it zooms to B5. This is C5. C15. Okay. If I want to see this in terms of a layout, I can go to zoom layout, which will actually take you to the layout settings. Now, if you remember the template that I used, it already has some predefined settings in terms of the title block, the arrow symbols that you want to use for connecting to the joining sheets, what layers I want to put into the key view, okay, and my legend and my north arrow, all that is defined in my in my template. So if I zoom in here. Okay, so this is, as you can see over here, what you've done is you've created a map. The next sheet on top is B15. So that's a hyperlink. So I can just control click on it. It will actually go and take me to B15 in terms of the, in terms of the layout. Now the beautiful thing about this is that if you are working in an environment where data changes all the time, right? This setting is used once, set once, and can be reused many times. So in other words, if I publish this on a weekly basis, I effectively have updated data that it can be published on a weekly basis. Now this updated data does not have to be a file. It can be in a database, which means that you can have people from all over the place, all over the country, accessing that information. And at the same time, you have this tool that reads that information on the fly, prints out or creates a little map book for you to publish and maybe use in the field. The, the, the opportunities that you have with this kind of uh, function is pretty much limitless. Just imagine you have an enterprise database like Oracle Spatial somewhere where everybody has his department updating it and the management wants to see this updated on a very regular basis for the service engineer or whoever to so clear the queue. This thing gets updated and they just cover it within any time and it's always updated. You don't have to do anything onto this at all. It's always updated. Yes, yes, you can see. Like I said, because I selected a key view which included two layers parcels and uh, buildings, that's where you see those two inside here. But if I had some other information that I wanted to show, I could actually include that as well. So that's, this, is, this is like your overview window, and what you have on this side is your actual raw data window. Okay, and you can again, like I said, you can control the way you do this at any point of time. Okay, well that pretty much is the end of the map demo. Again, like I said, key takeaways. Map is the universal client for GIS users, CAD users, it's the universal client for ESRI, not well. Again, when I'm saying this, don't go and say it's the only client because there are other clients. But it's a very powerful tool to connect to ESRI data, to Map Info data, 
It's a very powerful tool, obviously, to connect to AutoCAD data because it's AutoCAD. So engineers can use this product for doing the engineering precision kind of uh, digitization. Data capture people who, who do data capture. And when I say data capture, I don't just mean lines and arcs. I mean real world objects, like I showed you with the with that feature class. If you're going to a utility, we have a bunch of uh, definitions defined. I will, however, qualify that by saying that these definitions that I showed you earlier for utility, for example, electric, they have been created using a certain standard. It's not the same standard everywhere in, in, in the industry. So this is an ideal opportunity for you to engage the customer and services can be done there. You can actually create that feature class for them, all those feature classes that provide it to them as a, as a value add. Okay. So the other thing is that if you actually go to a utilities organization, a mapping organization, who tells you want to use AutoCAD, challenge them to say use our AutoCAD and connect to the database. I bet you with map, I can do it just like that. With AutoCAD, the guy will have to start it. Okay, and speaking of AutoCAD, we actually also have a sales tool where we have a comparison between AutoCAD and MAP. And we are in the process of doing a demo a script where you can take an AutoCAD on one side like that and a MAP on one side, do the same functionality and show how you can improve your productivity using the left hand side one, that is the MAP. But anyways, okay, this is it. Uh, like I said, it's a very quick demo, mainly to showcase the whole, uh, the fact that MAP looks awesome in my opinion now. Let's just quickly move into Map Guide. Well, of course, okay, with, with MAP, you have all these tools that can create data, and you have so much of data lying around your office, and obviously this data serves a function. But the most important thing really about data is its use. You have to be able to get people to use it. The more people who use it, the more valuable the data becomes. And the perfect tool, and again, I'm using extremes here because I really believe it's true, the perfect tool to do that is MapGuide. Because what you can do with MapGuide is you can take all the data your organization has, put them into use in applications that your consumers down the line can make use of. So I'm just going to show one demo. Uh, some of you may have seen this, and the moment you see it again, you'll be like, oh, not again. But for those of you who haven't seen this, I think this is a pretty good demo in terms of showing the concept. Don't knock, there'll be questions. OK? It's a good old Sheboygan data set again. I know every, every where we go, every day, we just talk about Sheboygan. I actually know this place really so well. If I actually go there, I know exactly where to go. So anyways, okay, looking at the interface, map guide, client on the web, okay? Terms of ease of use, all your users really need is a browser and access to the application. Okay, in terms of setup, map guide is one of the easiest products to set up on the web. It, this is in terms of implementation, okay? What we have over here is obviously the same data set I was using earlier. Uh, like I said, I didn't have enough time to go through a full workflow, but it's the same area. Now if I can, what I can do with MapGuide is given the fact that I have all this information, I can put them all together into one seamless interface where any user, technical, non-technical, GIS, CAD, engineering, marketing, anyone who needs access to this information can go and use it. Okay, so I'm just zooming in. I'm just showing you some of the capabilities of MapGuide in terms of bringing data in based on what scale you're looking at. The information that you get really is restricted by what information you have. Okay, so in this case, as you can see, I have a full like city kind of a data set. This is actually for, this is a municipal mapping application. Now, of course I zoom in. I can do all my thematics on the fly over here as well. So if I want to just do a ward map, I can switch that on, switch that off. Pass a type map. If I go into land information, I can do the land use map. Again, so simple to do, so simple to use. But in terms of the work going into it, you have to obviously someone has to capture this information, put attributes to it, and so on. But once that information is available, we can use, use it in our bed. Okay, in terms of utilities, we can switch on our utilities layers. We have maintenance layers, public safety layers, where you can have patrol areas, all that sort of thing. Political information. I'm gonna go to tools, because what I wanna show you is this whole capability of MapGuide to even be a very powerful, well, in a, in a way, analysis tool. And not necessarily analysis in terms of calculation, but analysis in terms of location. So let's say if I'm look, looking for a particular person called John. Okay, I can just hit enter. In this case, what we're doing is we're going into the database. Now, this database does not have to be a GIS database. And I point that out because in life, I wouldn't say in life, but in any IT environment, GIS is not the end of the world. Okay, there's information elsewhere. What we do with our map guide is we give you a mapping or a graphical <coughs> interface into whatever information you have. If you need to see it graphically, you can use map guide. 
So in this case, this database could be managed by someone else, maybe a census department. They have no idea what GIS is. They don't even talk GIS. They don't even talk CAD. They don't even know what AutoCAD is. But they do have a, the database where they have the owners. And maybe what you have is you have one person from uh, the map, map guide department or a map guide the person telling them that what we want is we want just the coordinate information for that. So let's say if, I'm, if the person I'm looking for is this guy over here. I can just quickly zoom into that person's parcel. You see it automatically highlights that. Now, okay, I just remember I need to start something. But okay. wait, any map guide application that we see, the interface doesn't come standard. I mean, for every organization, you tend to have the own flavor, right? It's tailored, it can be tailored to an organization needs rather than being standard out of the box. Okay, so I mean, what we're doing over here is, uh, once I click on a parcel, if I want further information, on the right hand side, we have a report. Now, again, I'm going to take a, I'm going to just step maybe outside my bounds a little bit and say that this report on the right can be integrated from anywhere. It could be highly complicated systems that they have in, the, in their uh, MIS section, but we can integrate that in. And what we are doing over here effectively is we are looking at their legal description. This could be coming from one database. Valuation could be coming from another database. This could be coming from a third one. This could be coming from a fourth one. But that's the benefit we have when you do a web-based project, is that you can integrate a lot of solutions together. And this is what we've done over here. So if I go and click on the next one, for example, it will show me the information for that particular parcel. Okay. Uh, let's go and look at another tool that we have. Now in this case, there's already something inserted there, so I'm just going to pan out. You notice how easy it is to work with the data as well. I'm just doing a pan. I'm just using my mouse, dragging it across, and information is just coming on the fly. Whenever I need something to see, whenever I go to an area where something needs to be displayed, it comes in. Now what we're going to do over here is we're going to go and create a work order. This is a bit of a public, uh, public uh, interface for the public. Now let's say if you want a feedback to this particular municipal government saying that, okay, over here, I live over here, something out here, I have a pothole, right? So I click on that spot, I go and put my name in. This is just an example of a workflow that has been set up. We can set up any kind of workflow. Again, it depends on what the customer really does in his, in his, in his or her workplace. Just put in my number there as well. And then my problem I'll say is that uh, we'll just say uh, manhole cover has blown or something. Okay, and we'll say that my house is flooded because of that. So I submit the service request. Are you? Okay. <laughs> I submit the service request and in, the, in, the, in, the, in an ideal world it actually goes in and creates an entity there. But anyways, okay, once you have something inserted like that, if I just go and click on it, what you should see is you should see be able to see the workflow that has been set up by the by the customer. And you can be you can go and uh, edit that. I actually know what the problem is, I'll probably fix it and when you do the technical session I'll show this to you in more detail. Uh, let's go into simulation. Okay, what we can do with AVL simulation, this is again just a concept that we can do with MapGuide where MapGuide can be your base for rapidly changing data, or in other words, real time data. Now, this example, just I'm just going to do a simulate tracking. We're actually going to simulate the tracking of a particular vehicle on a map. Okay, now this information gets updated based on whatever system they use. They may have GPS, which gets sent to a base station. But as far as we are concerned, what we're doing with MapGuide is we're giving them a tool which allows them to follow the movement of this particular car. So this automatically opens out uh, avenues such as uh, you know, vehicle tracking, uh, fleet management. That sort of thing. Okay, so I'm just going to stop that now. And finally, I'm going to show you one last thing. Let's just go to this particular problem here. You see, there's actually been a problem, and someone has uh, reflected that. Okay. okay you'll actually know what the problem is. The problem is sewer backup. Okay, it was submitted by me, and it's been. It hasn't been assigned yet. Now I don't want to go and assign it right now because my database is not working. But the idea is that because this information is there, and this tooltip. Incidentally, one of the very powerful features of MapGuide is that we can see information on the map by just moving a cursor over it. This information can come from, again, anywhere. I keep saying anywhere, anywhere, like integrate any system, because it's actually true. We can do this sort of thing very easily. So now that we have this information, let's say that what we need to do is we need to do some work in that area, right? 
Now, the moment work has to be done in an area, people have to be notified. Now, this is an example of a very simple application, but again, a very powerful tool. Let's say it's someone, someone sitting in the office and uh, admin staff. The admin staff's job is to send letters to each one of these people around here within 200 feet and inform them that we're going to have some rework done in that area. So please do not flush while we're working. Yeah, because then the people over there may get away. So how do you do that? Well, it's a simple application. You just double click on it. And what this does for you is automatically isolates a region that we need to notify. I click on the region we need to notify. It automatically selects all the parcels we need to notify. Okay? I go down there. If I want to export this into an Excel spreadsheet, I can export it to an Excel spreadsheet. Pump it into a mail merge application. And effectively what we have is we have that particular job that the person had to do, which is to notify the people of rework, done in three steps, few seconds, because simply because all this information is available, and you have created an application that allows you to use that information. Okay, so that really is the benefit of that guy. Before I close and pass the floor to Noah, I'm just going to go back to Beaton because these are some of the samples that we actually. Uh, uh, Okay, I actually wanted to show you this example because we can also incorporate <coughs> aerial photography and imagery in our map guide. Again, this is again a very, very powerful thing simply because this kind of thing, you know, satellite imagery and so on is available and it's not very expensive. And it, perf and it performs a very useful function. Let's see if I zoom in, okay, now just, just have a look at what happens. Okay, I'm zooming in, I'm zooming in, okay, because I set up my map guide in a certain way. It actually automatically goes and brings out layers and shows me information which is related to that particular way. I hope there's no problem there. Okay, good. I zoom in further. Now what we're doing is we're taking all our vector data, that is data that has been captured, and superimposing it on a photograph. So it actually give, makes it more, uh, gives more meaning to that particular area that you're working with. Okay, in this case, I don't really want to see this particular thematic, so I can switch it off. I zoom in further, I zoom in further. <coughs> You see how close I can zoom in, okay? You can actually zoom in all, you saw where I started off from. I started off from that's a wide view and I zoomed in all the way down. Okay. Now I see this house, I see this photograph and I see a house there. But it means nothing to me until I know what that house is, who the owner is, in my, let's say in this particular application. So what do I need to do for that? You don't hit F1, that's for sure. But what you do instead is you go into your select, just put your cursor on it. Of course, I need to switch on the layer which actually has that information, so I need to switch that on. Uh, this concept of zooming in and it starts showing more and more details is all the cost and normalization. You can actually customize the map in such a way that when it's actually looking at a very high level, you only see very little details. But when it gets down to a detail where it's meaningful to see the information, the details pops up. All right? So that's how we do it. We can actually control map guide to show that different scale, show more content, show more information. Okay, we're just going to stop here, I guess, because we really are running out of time. The technical people, trust me, are going to do a lot more on this later on. Okay. So we'll Since just I'm not going to do it, you guys will do it afterwards, all right? Yeah, so so uh, let's let's get Noel up here to show you on Silver 3D. Have an idea of what it does. See for yourself why Silver 3D is so interesting and so powerful. And then we're going to have a quick Q&A before we get uh, KG up to draw the ROI metrics. Okay? We are wondering why the fuss about Civil 3D? Okay? What is Civil 3D? Before we had LDT Civil Design Survey. It actually uh, is, a, is a per component basis in the sense that in order to have Civil Design, you need to have LDT. In order to use Survey, you need to have LDT. We've come up with Civil 3D because we found a need in the market. There are actually engineers out there looking for a more intuitive, a more dynamic solution as compared to LDT. In a moment, I'm going to show you the reason why Civil 3D is making a lot of noise. Okay? First off, let's work with the interface. As you can see, looks a lot like your usual AutoCAD, okay? By the way, 
it's built on top of AutoCAD 2006, so everything that AutoCAD 2006 comes with, it's in Civil 3D, okay? So you've got your standard menus, you've got your, uh, this is a new one, this is a new one, it's a, it, this is the tool space, it's a new concept of working uh, with civil engineering objects. And I'm not going to concentrate on the menus, because Civil 3D, being intuitive, has got a new trick up its sleeve, okay? I'm going to start with a, a drawing or something. By the way, Civil 3D works with styles, layers, but I'm not going to go, go into detail for, uh, about that because all the technical people are going to have a lot of uh, work. You, you've got your work cut out for you. Don't worry. Okay? Let me start off with an alignment. In reality, a project is never final until it's built. Change is always there. Change is always there. That's why we need something dynamic. When you change something, everything has to be updated. The problem in the industry is, the usual pro problem in a design company, if there's a, change, if there's a change in the alignment, or if there's a change somewhere in the design, you need to update everything, okay? And some of the clients just can't afford too much time updating things. Uh, I've heard from my good friend in Hawaii, 90% of your work is actually at the 10%, final 10%, okay? Everybody understand that? Meaning, when you're about to finish your project, a change, even a minute change, tears everything up, okay? So you got to rework from the ground up, almost. Moving on, let me just open a, project, uh, a drawing. Okay, uh, I've created a base map here. This base map actually is built from land XML, from DXF, and from point data. So this just shows how Civil uh, 3D can work with different types of data. If you want to export land XML, by the way, land XML is a non-platform specific data. So you can work with different platforms or different software in the market. You can work with Bentley, you can work with Intergraph, you can work with Haystad methods, you can work with practically any software that exports or imports Land XML can communicate with Civil 3D. So we are not limiting you to working with Civil 3D alone. Okay? Which is quite important, especially in civil engineering. You can't say, you can't tell your partner that, oh, you need to have Civil 3D because I'm working with Civil 3D. So the, indus the industry has come up with Land XML. Okay, it's a group effort, it's an industry-wide effort. Bentley's into it, Autodesk is into it. So all of, the, all of the big names in the industries help develop Land XML. <coughs> Moving on, talking about the dynamism within Civil 3D, since it's built in within AutoCAD, as you can see, if I pause my cursor somewhere, on my surface, you can see the dynamic report, okay? It gives you information up front. This is because Civil 3D was built considering that engineers need to be more focused on the design, not on the drafting, drafting part. Drafting only comes second nature in Civil 3D, okay? Designers need to design more, not to draft more. Remember that. Moving on, <clears throat> let's say you need to uh, you need to create something like an alignment. Just go to alignments, create by layout. You are then presented. Let's give it a name. You are then presented with a toolbar. Okay. Now this toolbar is going to come in handy in the sense that everything you do in Civil 3D is going to be based on toolbars. Okay? What this does is it makes the use, it, it makes uh, life uh, easier for the user. If you know how to use a toolbar for the horizontal alignment, it's much easier to learn how to use it for vertical alignment, for pipes, okay? For parcels, because you don't have to look for everything on the menu, know where to uh, go look, look, look for certain commands, because everything's there. All that you need to uh, manage, create, and ed edit data pertaining to a certain object in civil engineering is 
within the toolbar. Okay? If I need to lay out my alignment, I just pick a command from the toolbar or There are actually uh, different uh, different ways of uh, doing this. I'm just going to give you an example. By the way, Civil 3D, it, being a design software, has to adhere to certain criteria. Okay? If you're a civil engineer, you need to input uh, how much radius, how much, how much bear, uh, what's the bearing on this alignment, things like that. Engineering criteria. So we can input those in Civil 3D and create our data. And from then on, you can be assured that everything adheres to those criteria. Okay? Let's just do this quickly. Click here. There and there. So as you can see, as soon as I do that, you notice that automatically everything is labeled in accordance to a style that is assigned to that object. I've mentioned that Civil 3D extensively uses styles. Now, what are styles? Styles are actually a, a good way of working or, or uh, designing things in uh, Civil 3D. Let's just say uh, you need to see some other type of data with regard to the surface. I'm using another, uh, a, a certain style for the surface, which is called the uh, contours background. Now, if I need to see different display or analysis data, all I have to do is go to this uh, surface style select, and as soon as I click, uh, as soon as I uh, select another style, it displays my object data. In this example, the surface data, watershed data. Okay. So as easy as ch uh, changing styles, you can uh, automatically. Change the way everything is displayed in Civil 3D. Same goes for same goes for other types of data and other objects. Let's say for alignments, we have styles for that. How things are labeled, how things are displayed, it's all in styles. It's a one. It's a one step. Uh, it's a set up once and work work with it, whatever you want to. Or in future projects, you can use that certain style once you set it up. Okay, styles are stored in a template, by the way. And you can use that template in future projects. And well, talking so about styles. Just, just an example of this is that if you actually work in, for those who actually work with terrain modelings before, yeah. you notice when I actually look at the terrain, I can actually display as contours, I can display it as grids, I can display it as triangulation. And those are technical terminology that people do. But every time when someone says, I want to show I want you to present to me the model in say triangulation. That poor guy actually have to go back to his drawing model, regenerate the entire model to show triangles. Yeah, exactly. in what, in with Civil 3D, I don't do that because when I build the model, all this information are stored automatically into the model. All I need to do is just switch on and off what I want to see, how I want to see it, and that's about it. All right? I don't have to do a regeneration of the entire thing at all. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, Civil 3D is so intuitive, it's so dynamic in the sense that there are two views. Uh, with, with a certain view comes a certain display. Let's say I want to uh, view uh, 2D and 3D at the same time. And as easy as that, I, this, side, uh, this side you can see that I'm uh, viewing a triangulation. On the other side, I'm viewing a, a 3D model. Okay. So this is much easier in the sense that you don't need to import redundant data just to create multiple views. Before, we need to import certain points, we need to do certain setups before you can come up with different displays. With this, uh, with Civil 3D, by simply changing the view and selecting a style, you can create multiple views. Okay? Let's just change that to borders and controls. Okay, simply by choosing a style, I can manipulate everything that is displayed in my screen. <coughs> Moving on, 
just gonna open uh, another drone here. I've mentioned the dynamism within Civil 3D. Whenever a change is made, the change should propagate all throughout your design. I'm gonna do a simple profile here. Okay, from surface. And by simply, <clears throat> I'm actually do, uh, going to do a multiple profile. So uh, by simply choosing a style once again, I can control everything on how everything is uh, displayed in my screen. I click here. Oh, wait, I forgot something. Choose the alignment. Uh, and draw a profile. Okay. As soon as I do that, I automatically have my profile on the screen. By the way, Civil 3D, since it makes use of styles extensively, you have styles for alignments, you have styles for profiles, you have styles for surfaces. Bottom line, every object depends on styles at least how it is displayed on your screen and since we've been uh, mentioning the dynamism within civil 3d if you need to do a change let's say uh, you can just focus uh, on the profile and I'm dragging one of the grips on my horizontal alignment okay so every change propagates throughout your design and if you need to create, let's say uh, we're satisfied with the profile, we need to create a finished ground, the finished grade for that. Let's just put there easy. You are then again presented with a similar to toolbar. This drastically reduces the learning curve, makes it easier for engineers to learn how to use the product, make, makes it easier for engineers to be efficient in the shortest possible time yeah. and th that is important in every project time is of the essence okay likewise whenever you use uh, that toolbar civil civil 3d being a, <clears throat> a criteria based software You are then presented for every for every command that you have in Civil 3D. You are presented with criteria, especially for horizontal, vertical, and cross sections, everything. So the the bottom line here is, if you have design criteria, all you need to do is set those things up and input your data. The drafting comes second nature. Okay, I'm I'm putting uh, I'm putting a lot of stress on that point. You are not drafting with Civil 3D. You are designing with Civil 3D. The drafting is being handled by the software itself. Okay? This gives you more focus in your design. And... Uh, okay. Continuing continue with, uh, with the road design, I'm just gonna open another drawing here. I'm, I'm, I'm doing this very fast pace because uh, uh, I need to... Uh, keep up with the 15 minutes. Let's say you need to uh, design your road. We, Civil 3D, by the way, makes use of corridor models. But before I go into corridor mo models, what, what are the requirements with corridor models? You've got horizontal alignment. You need to have a vertical, vertical profile. And you need to have an assembly. This is quite interesting in the sense that assemblies, by definition, represent real-world objects. I'm going to show you what uh, assemblies are in a bit. Okay. Let's say uh, you need to use a certain components. Assemblies are actually uh, a combination of, uh, of sub-assemblies which represent real-world world objects like the lanes, the shoulders, uh, curves for this example 
We actually have a catalog for that. And all you need to do, set that up. If you need to use certain components, all you have to do is click here, drag and drop to your tool palette. Oops. There. So as you can see, if I put my cursor here, it changes it to an eye drop icon and it's as easy as that. If you need to use that component, just drag it and drop it. Okay? In consideration to uh, how much time we have, I've already set up some uh, tool palettes here. You have main super, outside super, you have uh, other components here. But to emphasize more on how things are done as far as uh, corridors are modeled and assemblies are created, let's just create a simple assembly here to show you what I mean. Click OK. If I need to use certain components, let's say I need to put up a, a typical roadway section which contains a lane, contains a curve, and a forge or side slopes. It's as easy as that. Now then again, I need to do that for, this, for the other side, so I just click here left and choose other components okay there you go as soon that it's done uh, as soon as it's, uh, we're done with that I'm gonna create a corridor by the way a cor the corridor is uh, the essence of civil 3d okay the corridor model is your dynamic model within civil 3d this is what enables us to, uh, this is what ensures that uh, we are working with consistent and accurate data. Whatever change we do with the section, whatever change we do with the profile or the horizontal alignment, it's already updated and all the changes propagate throughout your design. Let's just create a corridor. Uh, create a corridor. Corridor, say main road. Click OK. So I'm going to select this baseline. I'm going to select the profile. And I'm going to select the assembly. Now I'm setting up logical names here. I'm going to go into detail uh, for the about the, the logical names when we get to the technical part of the training later on this afternoon. So as you can see, as soon as I do that, I've created a 3D object of my road design. <clears throat> okay, let's just zoom in there. Okay, so as you can see, this is the typical roadway section that we applied along with the side slopes and your lanes. And I've mentioned, I, I, uh, I mentioned that for whatever change done in a certain component, it propagates all throughout Civil 3D. So what I'm going to do here, let's just zoom in on uh, the corridor. Whatever change you do in Civil 3D, let's say uh, I'd like to change the width of the lane, Let's go into uh, this dialog box here. Change the width. Let's say, let's put there 25. As soon as I do that, what is that? Oh no. I have to uh, put that on rebuild with an automatic. Okay? As soon as I do that, our corridor model updates in correspondence to the change that you did. And if I drag one of the vertical intersections here, see, let's just put this here. It's calculating, it's, it's doing its calculations, and as soon as it's done, where are you? Wait, let's do that again. 
again. Okay, so as you can see, as soon as, I, uh, as soon as I'm done with the changes, quarter model updates, save you time, save you effort. Okay? Bottom line, with Civil 3D, you work better, faster, and smarter. Okay? I've got, uh, I've got a lot of, uh, I got, I've got a lot more features to show you, but it's going to take uh, too much time. And uh, considering uh, how much we have right now, I'm just going to save it for the technical track and uh, move on to the next. Yeah, from Civil 3D okay. over here, it's just to get you have a glimpse of what you can do with yeah. this product that we have. You notice we only show you just a little bit on the surface. We have not shown you the base renderer that comes with Civil 3D. We have not even shown you that for every change in profile, your earthwork gets updated automatically. You know, your assemblies get changed any time along the fly, information gets up. The cross section that you see for those who actually guys get involved in road design. Cross-section profiles, vertical <laughs> profiles are something that you have to produce every time when you design or construct the road. All these are drafting. We don't do that in that sense. The system produces those for you. All right? You focus yourself in generating and maintaining the model. That's why you notice in Mac 3D and Server 3D, everything is focused around the model. Okay? okay. Let the system manage the drafting. Okay, excuse me, Evans. I forgot to mention, as soon as you're done with your corridor model, your design, you can actually visualize it in this manner. And this is just, oh, let me get back on that. And this is just your, what, what I might call a pre preliminary visualization, in the sense that you can do better, better visualizations uh, with this. Okay? What this does, it, it gives you, it gives you, uh, uh, more or less of what your design looks like. If you see something wrong with your design, you can actually go in, do the change, and be ensured that all, whatever change you do in your design propagates all throughout your design documents. Okay? In a, in, a, in, in, a, in a nutshell, this is just a tip of the iceberg. Okay, we can do so much with Civil 3D. Yeah, you yeah. can bring the information across into a more powerful rendering software like 3D Studio Max, 3D Studio Viz. Uh, it actually comes with Viz Viz Renderer. Yes.